Hello, good evening and welcome to The Review. On tonight's program, we're going to be covering a number of areas, including the state of the labour market, the Colombo Stock Exchange's efforts to go paperless, and we'll also be talking about banking and finance regulations with the chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. First, a look at this week's top stories. Ministry of Foreign Affairs releasing a statement said reports suggesting that Sri Lanka imported textiles from North Korea violating UN sanctions are erroneous. However, the ministry said custom house agents in Sri Lanka had accidentally selected the Democratic People's Republic of Korea instead of the Republic of Korea as the country of export at the point of data entry into the customs automated data processing system. The erroneous data may have resulted the UN Security Council panel of experts for the implementation of the respective resolutions to include Sri Lanka in a list of countries alleged to have imported textiles from North Korea. The Reuters new agency citing a confidential UN report said North Korea had violated a textile ban by exporting more than $100 million in goods to eight countries including Sri Lanka. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs said as a member of the UN, Sri Lanka abides by the provisions of the UN Security Council resolutions in Sri Lanka to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Sri Lanka has clarified the inadvertent error to the UN Security Council panel of experts and Sri Lanka Customs has initiated a mechanism to prevent such errors in the future. The Columbus Stock Market Depository and Settlement Service Provider said it is offering digital account opening options for investors and electronic share issues and voting for shareholders. The Central Depository Systems Private Limited, which is a fully owned subsidiary of the Columbus Stock Exchange, is looking to make investments easier. The government's vision for 2025 aims to make Sri Lanka the hub of the Indian Ocean with a knowledge-based, highly competitive social market economy. With its strategic geographic location in the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka is well poised to become an export-oriented economic hub at the center of the Indian Ocean. The government says intermediary objectives of this strategy is to create one million new jobs and to create an environment where citizens can achieve higher incomes and improve standards of living. We spoke to Dr. Ganesh Vignaraja from the Lakshman Kadiragama Institute to discuss what steps need to be taken to increase efficiency and flexibility of the labor market to help boost economic growth. So Sri Lanka doesn't conform to the typical Lewis model pattern of employment creation by a modern sector uh, where the labor seamlessly comes from the rural sector. Our growth rate in Sri Lanka is about 3.2 percent according to the first quarter of 2018 and we have an unemployment rate of 4.3 percent which is historically low in Sri Lanka. So essentially there is a labor scarcity problem particularly for the private sector and so we need to think about reforming the labor market with a few measures implemented gradually over time and the private sector stepping up its game. The main reforms that I think we need to consider are first increasing the participation of women in the labor force and we would do this by ensuring that there is affordable childcare so young mothers can get back to work. Uh, the private sector needs to think of subsidized creches uh, or nurseries and we need to think of village level community nurseries. A second thing we have to think about when we come to women's participation is a kind of a me too social movement to ensure that uh, women are not harassed on the way to work uh, through public transport or at the same time in the workplace and we need to have compulsory training um, in the workplace so that uh, people are aware of gender equality issues and that harassment is a taboo and a no-no. The second very important thing we have to try to do is to ensure that university graduates um, upgrade their skills and this really comes in the form of firstly English education because this is something that's going to be terribly important as Sri Lanka wants to globalize uh, in the future and the English education levels and speaking English in particular levels are quite poor amongst university graduates today. Um, a second thing is they lack the experience of working in business. So I think internships as part of a degree program are very essential. That is during the, the kind of long holidays but also at Christmas. 
um, and private sector firms should try to provide those sorts of opportunities and universities themselves must upgrade their careers offices so that these types of linkages are there as part of a degree program and as part of providing opportunities for young people. The public sector I think has 17.7% of the working population today and this becomes increasingly unsustainable uh, when we face a debt to GDP ratio of 77% which is historically high. So we need to think of some measures to restructure the public sector so we can ensure that it is uh, very focused on service delivery of a lesser size than it is today and natural retrenchment is important. Uh, so as people retire, those jobs are not replaced. Um, and then we have to look at those who are actually in employment, what is the work that they actually do. So we need some sort of national audit. Um, so we must begin to tackle this issue as well. Stay with the review. On the other side, we'll be joined by Mr. Rajendra Tiagaraja, the chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, to talk about banking and finance regulation. Welcome back to the program. With controversies surrounding microfinance and several finance companies, questions are being asked about the state of banking and finance regulations in the country. To talk about this and more, we're joined on the show this evening by one of the country's most celebrated bankers and also chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Rajendra Tiagaraja. Mr. Tiagaraja, thank you very much for taking uh, time off to come uh, sit with us today. Uh, I want to start by asking you, when we talk about banking and finance regulations, periodically this comes up, um, even with licensed finance companies and now with the microfinance sector as well. Do you see any shortcomings or problems that urgently need to be addressed as far as this sector is concerned? The microfinance? Um, yes and no. I think from a no point of view, the, the biggest gap I think got captured with the introduction of the Microfinance Act itself, which hopefully the intent is to make sure between the Microfinance Act, which governs those institutions which are not captured by the central bank, hopefully there will be no cracks falling in between. So it, time will tell whether these two, uh, these two uh, frameworks uh, work in tandem to make sure that that slippage does not happen. So it's a bit early days, but it's in the right direction. Sure. Do you feel that there are some who would argue that uh, as far as the financial services sector is concerned, as a whole, banks, finance companies, even microfinance, that Sri Lanka may be over-regulated. Do you get a sense of over-regulation in Sri Lanka's financial services sector? See, uh, the word over is always a very a relative term. And I think depending on which point in time you are, um, one has to take cognizance. For example, when the country was going through these three decades of uh, conflict, uh, there was a dire, very strict, clear need to introduce the uh, anti-money laundering and the terrorist financing thing. So it was a very, and at that time Sri Lanka was one of the probably early adapters in the entire South Asia. But today the shift is more than the terrorism side on the money laundering side. So I think as, as, as the economy evolves, uh, the type of regulation will also have to adapt, keep on changing. Do you feel that uh, the pace of regulatory reform uh, to meet these challenges of evolving economy has been, of an evolving economy has been adequate. Do you feel that uh, regulators are keeping pace with the changing needs? This is uh, my personal view, not a Ceylon Chamber's view. I think an overall, I think from a safety net perspective, on the safety side, I think that the framework is fairly robust. But where we would like to see a bit more adaptation is uh, regarding some of the new developments which are taking around us globally, especially in terms of technology adoption and the way financial services are conducted, and to see how Sri Lanka can also be a part of that. So rather than being a follower to try and see how early we can adapt, and if I can pick on two or three uh, very important bits of legislation which have a direct correlation to inclusion. 
uh, first would be the requirement or the urgent need for biometric identification. See, we are with 20 million people, but we've had a neighbor with over a billion people who has had the courage to go through and then bring in what they call the other. As a result of that today, in any village, you can today do basic services with a small a card reader, not only doing banking services or payments, but even I'm told as much as 40 or 50 government enabled services like even copies of marriage certificates and birth certificates from that same connectivity because you have empowered that village agency banker to be able to do that. Uh, but fundamental to all that has been the ease of uh, connecting people. The second thing is also uh, when you look into this microfinance and inclusive space it's still very much a semi-urban rural centric ecosystem uh, while you certainly have urban micro but bulk of it is outside and the more deeper you get out the cost of engaging that ecosystem becomes higher. So Again, it's one of the reasons as to why some of the bigger institutions tend to keep away the cost efficiency. Uh, or the way uh, I think most of other mature markets have handled this is brought in the ease of onboarding. Now we even have this thing called the Know Your Customer onboarding. Uh, and one thing which we have been lobbying is for the introduction of what we call the EKYC, which will certainly help uh, the more regulated formal institutions to improve and increase their reach uh, and onboard far more uh, people who are outside the net th through a cost-effective and efficient means. So these are some of the examples of things we would like to see. And of course the third area which we would like certainly at some stage sooner than later is to see the adoption of blockchain. Uh, when you speak of uh, blockchain and uh, also coming from blockchain cryptocurrencies as well, now these are also regulatory challenges that other uh, regulators around the world, the uh, Federal Reserve in the US, the Reserve Bank of India, uh, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, you, these are challenges that you have to grapple with. Do you see any moves being made in Sri Lanka in terms of I regulating? I think, yes, we, we, we are very pleased to note, we are recognizing that uh, on one side you have progress and then you also have the need to preserve the system and have the safety and the trust system. So I think what we've seen as a welcoming uh, phenomena recently is the introduction of what we call sandboxing, uh, where instead of just pushing some new bit of technology into the system, uh, there is a move now to introduce a ring-fenced uh, environment where this sort of new technologies are experimented with, with the support of the regulator as well as industry and other experts. And once it is tested, then to gradually bring it into the system. And that's called sandboxing. It has uh, been practiced in a number of other jurisdictions. So it's a very welcoming uh, sign step in the right absolutely. direction. Um, the central bank uh, recently expressed concerns regarding interest rates. Uh, in the uh, financial services sector uh, and that interest rates were too high. Do you feel that these concerns of the central bank are warranted? Uh, I'm not going to uh, comment on the central bank's view because that, that I mean, obviously they, they are very wise I and mean, they, they're probably having enough economic fundamentals to justify their case. But if I look at it from a, a practical, practical practitioner's point of view, if you look at perhaps the last uh, decade or so, from say 2007 to 2017, a typical, I'm just talking about an average bank, the, uh, the quantum of loans in a total bank's balance sheet, which was around 53 cents to a rupee in 2007, has now gone up to about 65 over that decade. And most of it has come in by uh, reducing the, the liquid investments which were in the bank's balance, balance sheets and converting it into 
lending opportunities and also in addition to that increasing the amount of market borrowings as a percentage of the liabilities as which I think over the last decade it has increased by almost uh, 300 basis points. Now that naturally has also been as a result of heightened economic activity. Uh, so I think as far as the economy uh, keeps on going in the right direction, uh, you will always have uh, intermediation chasing after money, which means that there will always be a pressure on interest rates. Let me put the question to you this way, in a sort of a yes or no uh, format. Uh, are Sri Lanka's the interest rates that we're seeing <coughs> uh, quoted by banks and finance companies, etc., right now in Sri Lanka, are these uh, being dictated by market forces or are they artificial? To a great extent, I would say market forces are playing a role. But let's also not forget something. If you look at, uh, say, deposit rates, for example, we are today in the low. Uh, double digits, you know, in the in the 10, 12 percent, maybe 13 percent. But remember in the early 90s, interest rates were as high as 22 percent, right? So I think it is all very relative when you look at a particular point in time. Thank you, Mr. Deagraza. We're going for a short commercial break. Uh, when we come back, we'll be talking about the interests of depositors. Welcome back to the program. We're in conversation with Mr. Rajendra Thiagaraja, Chairman, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and Senior Banker. And we're talking about banking and finance regulations in the country. Uh, depositors, the interests of depositors uh, has been a question that has come up recently, especially in terms of uh, with the collapse of uh, finance companies over time. And uh, questions are being asked about whether the regulators in this country, whether the state, the central bank, is looking after the interests of people who have uh, placed their money in trust with these organizations. Do you see any shortcomings on that end? What we are probably seeing now in terms of the few publicly known failures uh, are a result of what has happened over time. But one has to also recognize during that period, the regulation and regulatory framework has also progressed. And I think in fairness, one needs to give recognition to that. And I guess if you, on hindsight, apply the framework which is in practice today uh, to institutions uh, which uh, triggered some of these issues maybe a decade or before ago, uh, the chances of some of these things happening, I would say, would be uh, very remote because there would have been triggers coming out. So I think that should be taken into account. Uh, Shortly before the uh, change in government, uh, I believe in 2014, the central bank at the time uh, proposed moves to consolidate uh, the financial services sector. Uh, do you think that this was a measure that was taken uh, possibly to stave off the kind of situation that we're seeing uh, today with ETI and with, uh, with other companies? And do you think it would have been successful and that they should have seen it through? Again, I have been a continuous vocal proponent of consolidation and it is purely from a demand and an opportunity perspective. Uh, I think despite uh, despite uh, criticism from various quarters that the then consolidation journey was enforced or coaxed. I am firmly of the belief that when you introduce something like consolidation for the first time into an industry, it doesn't work inviting two people to shake hands and do things. Uh, there has to be some sort of uh, actively encourage uh, marriage or consolidation it's only when one or two work does the rest of the industry come in. And if you really look at... So you can't expect them to fall in love. No, Sometimes you have to I, arrange the marriage. And I, I, I feel very sad that I was a part of uh, one of those marriages uh, which I thought would have worked just before the change. And for whatever reason, it didn't materialize in the last moment. But I think uh, 
again, if, if that uh, encouragement was there to push that consolidation. Uh, and if you look at some of the environments like Singapore, Malaysia, which has successfully reduced the number of institutions and got the better out of the limited stock of resources in this industry, they've all started through induced consolidation and then they pump. We're talking about the interests of depositors and protecting uh, deposits or lessening the risk, let's say. Do you feel that consolidation w may have been able to stave off or prevent the kind of collapses? Pro that probably seen? not. What's more important at that time would have been the governance framework which would have um, overlooked these institutions in terms of um, a few things. Risk management. Uh, the prevalence of risk management matrices and also in terms of uh, the, the governance architecture around boardrooms in terms of ownership etc. Uh, for example, I would say in a number of these cases uh, some of these failures have been because um, you have had people using short term liabilities to finance medium to long term assets and then got into liquidity situations. That doesn't mean that that investment is not viable, but the timing. Now today I think there are enough indicators through what they call an integrated risk management framework where all institutions which are regulated by the central bank have to have these things in place to trigger off. Secondly, unlike, I'm not talking about the past, but today, Directors are personally held liable. It's just not delegating things to management. So when someone comes into a boardroom, they can't turn back and say, I'm not familiar with this. You have to take trouble to get advice where necessary or, let, or study uh, what you, the reports you get and ask the right probing questions for management to do your job. So that oversight is not just a gentleman's club anymore. There is a serious uh, responsibility reposed on boards when they sit or accept board positions to overlook and govern institutions. So I think I think the the framework of uh, risk management and governance, which has probably evolved over the last 10 to 15 years at a much faster pace than maybe the previous two decades, in my opinion, uh, would and has played a major role in stemming the, the flow of failures. Uh, as far as depositors sort of insurance is, uh, in a recent conversation with a, with a former regulator, uh, I came to find out that uh, the depositors insurance scheme hasn't been triggered uh, in the case of a lot of these uh, sort of failed finance companies. Um, and in some cases, uh, it was alleged that uh, that the depositors' interests weren't looked after and it therefore allowed the owners of these finance companies to engage in asset stripping. Uh, do you feel that, does it surprise you rather that this, deposit, this depositors' insurance scheme which guarantees deposits up to 600,000 rupees I think has not been uh, utilized uh, as far as the recent failures that, they, that we have witnessed in the 2000s? I am not in a position to comment because I am not uh, aware of the actual facts. I have not been following that particular aspect. So, so I think it will be not fair for me to comment about whether the scheme was used or not. Yeah. Whether the scheme is adequate is something which the regulator will always have to uh, evaluate depending on the size of the industry, uh, how they see the industry stability and then decide whether it needs stopping up or not. But I, again, as I would like to say, I uh, <coughs> am not familiar because I have not been following the extent to which the existing fund was used or not. So I'm sorry, I'm not. Uh, Mr. Dhyagaraja, uh, we also hear a lot these days about Basel III and Basel III requirements. Uh, are Sri Lanka's banks Basel III compliant? Uh, how far away are we from being To give right. credit to the central bank, I think the central bank uh, started this journey uh, way back a couple of years ago uh, instead of inducing shocks into the system. So I think today we are in a journey 
uh, with increased and improved awareness of the framework and the preparation towards uh, Basel three. I think uh, in, in a measured pace, and I would say uh, the industry, I would say, is more ready than not ready. And I think some of the indicators, some of the new uh, triggers which have been introduced, like the liquidity coverage ratio, the net stable fund ratio, the leverage ratio, will certainly strengthen uh, the institutional capacity to make sure that these institutions are even more robust as they uh, engage into economic activity. Mr. Tiagaraja, thank you very much again for taking time oh, always a pleasure to, to talk here. to us. Uh, so there you have it, the thoughts of the Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and a very senior banker himself on the state of banking and finance regulations in Sri Lanka. What are your thoughts? Don't forget to share it with us on Facebook. You'll find us at Biz First Review 360. That's our show for this evening. I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. Good night and good luck.